let's stand on our feet. It's really, really, really hard to sing this song sitting down. It's really hard to sing it standing up. But uh, we're glad to see everyone today. Are y'all glad to be here? Awesome. All right. Uh, you can sing along, make somebody welcome, how whatever you feel, just feel relaxed and free. But I want to welcome you, and we're going to sing, I will fly away. So when the trumpet sounds... fingers is it? Can you hold your fingers up how old you are? Oh, he's got candy. He's got gummies. Take turn two. Yesterday. Yesterday. Who did? They turned five yesterday? Last Monday. Last Monday, Later. it's been birthdays galore at y'all's house. Blake had a birthday? Uh, my birthday is three days after the picnic that we're going to join the seven. Okay, don't let me forget. I'll forget it by then. Remind me, Blake. Anybody else have a birthday? Okay, not many. All right. Well, happy birthday, Tay. Amen. You know, if you're in God's hands, it's it's okay. No matter what you face, I always think of that that song. It is well with my soul, you know. And Brother Spafford, when he had lost his daughters at sea, and he wrote that song. It is well with my soul, and you know that's all. That's what matters. If you know anybody that's unsaved, that's the greatest need above all needs. You know, Christians, we're more than conquerors. Through everything, through his love, we're more than conquerors. But people that don't have the Lord, they don't have nothing. And so we just pray 
that our children and grandchildren and family and friends would come come to Christ. Amen? And His arms are wide open. So stand with me and let's pray together and lift our hearts toward heaven. And I hope God puts somebody on your mind to pray for. <laughs> Father, we, we just look to You this morning. God, with the eye of faith, we see You clearly. The eternal, almighty, ever-loving, ever-present God that You are. Father, we come as the clay to the potter. We come as the creature to our Creator. You made us. In You we live and move and have our being. The very breath we breathe is a gift from You today. Lord, we understand one day you'll take that last one. You give and you take away. God, I thank you with all my heart unceasingly for your son Jesus. Lord, that you took all this stuff we face. You faced it. You tasted death. Lord, you did it all and you did it for us. And we're so grateful and all oh, that we were more dedicated to you. There's no way we could repay to you, dear Lord, the love and mercy and grace that you've shown us this side of heaven. Lord, our prayer today lifted up these needs before you. Lord, I know that with you nothing is impossible. Lord, you open the sea. You speak and the sun begins to shine. Dear Lord, your power is infinite. And we look to you in faith this morning, Lord, that you would work in our lives. God, help us not to count you out of this equation with this world today. Lord, in a, in a, in a second, you could open the windows of heaven and pour out your spirit and things would change overnight because you're God. Lord, I just pray earnestly above all things for those who are without Christ, those we have nephews and nieces, children and grandchildren. Lord, we just pray for their salvation. That's what you come to do, Jesus. You come to seek and save that which was lost. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. And I just pray, Lord, that we just experience you today and let go of the world and let go of self and worship you for who you are. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. Father, in Jesus' wonderful saving name, God's people say, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Come on, let's turn our eyes toward Jesus and worship Him.
short and sweet this morning. That's all we need to know, right? All right, you can get your packet and get your coloring sheet and your snack, okay? Okay. I'm not going to preach this morning. I want to just talk to you about something that is probably the most important, one of the most important messages I could ever share with a congregation, okay? This is so important to me. I'm going to have um, Mr. Corbin, Ben, you and Blake come up here and pass something out. And I want to give you this. It's just a rough, simple thing, but I want you to fold it up, put it in your Bible, give it to somebody, a young couple as parents that has children, keep it for yourself. It's, it's a tool that I want to give you, um, some things that I will be talking about this morning. I just, you know, what's on my heart, obviously God puts this on my heart to share with you this morning. And um, I'm going to be taking it from 2 Peter chapter 3. And I want to read verses 1 through, uh, through 10. And I just want to talk about one word in one verse. Probably one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Word of God. You, you might say, well, John 3.16 would be the most beautiful. Well... This verse carries with it the spirit of John 3.16. Um, we're not in no hurry, gentlemen. Did y'all pass them out? Just lay them there on the chair and make sure you guys get one too. Um, I, wanna, I want you to have this. Uh, ben, this is Im really important to you um, as a young minister. This is important to when I look around at Ben and Haley and young parents with children, this is a very important message. And there's no way I can even stress how important what I want to share with you today. That's why I give you this, because I want you to hold on to it. If you have grandchildren uh, or anybody that you might, that God might use you to influence to come to Christ. Um, and I want you to think about that. I don't know what you would tell a person who's lost and wanting to go to heaven and asking you how to get there. I don't know how you would respond to that. I don't, I don't know what you would tell them. I don't know what you would do. And na naively, dangerous, no, no way I can emphasize the, the, the danger of parents saying, I just let the youth leader do that. I just let the preacher do that. Oh, I'm getting chills right now when parents just turn them over to a religious person. And it may be somebody you trust, but you have no idea what they would do with your child. And so we're just so, so, so naive about these things. Because I'm, I, call me old-fashioned. I don't care what you call me. When, when it come down to Ben and Beth's salvation, nothing was more sacred to Daphne and I than not just the fact that they were saved, but we wanted to make sure they were saved the Bible way. Okay? Not some way that some, somebody thought up. You make it a little simpler and a little easier. Let me tell you something. Go, you know, tell most women having a baby's piece of cake. There's travail. Amen, ladies? Well, salvation is compared to that. Okay? Let's read. We've been talking about the second coming of Christ a lot. 
Peter writes this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, the commandment of the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there will come in the last days scoffers, or mockers, or scoffers, walking after their own lust. And they'll be saying, here's what they say, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But this they willingly, willingly were ignorant of. They purposefully shut their mind to the fact that uh, by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's pretty self-explanatory. What God did years ago with the flood, he'll do one day with fire. All he's got to do is take his little fingers and open the ozone just a little bit, and the sun would burn us up in a matter of seconds. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And so God ain't on time. He gave time for us and our benefit, okay? So if you, want to, if you want to get on God's time real quick, guess what? Jesus died two days ago. That's pretty fresh, isn't it? Okay. And here's the beautiful verse. I want to talk about a word in this verse. This is so, this is so God. And I don't care what you think about God. When you read this verse, you have to admit, he's wonderful. The Lord's not slow or slack concerning his promise, the promise that Jesus is coming back, as some men count slackness or slowness. But the very reason Jesus hadn't come is because God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Isn't God beautiful? Amen. You know, the very scoffers that use the argument, well, you know, it's happened in every generation. Nothing's changed. But yet they fail to see the reason it hasn't is because God has given them an opportunity to get on his ark. Amen. Isn't that ridiculous? And you know what? Every generation, and you've said this, you've thought it, especially if you live right now, you're thinking, boy, this world's coming to an end really fast. And they've been saying it for hundreds and, and, and literally two millennial. They've been saying, whoo, I, I could show you stuff in writings, especially of Christian scholars who just knew, okay, it's over. I mean, the day's dark. People are living in sin. It's ugly. We're there. And that's okay. We're to always believe that Jesus is nigh and near. Now, I have my own opinion of that because we read in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away with great noise. Elements will melt with fervent heat in the earth um, and the works will be burned up. Now, I have my own opinion of that, which I don't want to get into, but I'll just say this. If there's only one reason I believe my generation is closer to Christ coming than any other generation is because no other generation has ever had nuclear capability. And the words that Peter uses <clears throat> are the very thing that Jesus is how he will do it. I mean, if Jesus splits the, the sky church, he can come with such an atomic bang. I mean, you don't, it's, it's just unimaginable, unimaginable. And so when nine countries have that capability, but the Bible says man will not destroy himself, but when he thinks about wanting to destroy, the Lord will come. So that's an only an argument for me. But I don't want to go there this morning. I want to go to a word that I want you to know and me to know. Let me, give, let me begin with an example. Um, hang on just a minute. I put a little girl's name at the bottom of that page, and I want to begin with her. Her name is Cheyenne Perry, and uh, Cheyenne uh, 
is a, one of the best examples God has given me of what I want to talk to you about this morning. Cheyenne was a little girl, and I don't know how old she was. She was probably White's age, seven years old or something, and, and I had preached a revival up at Seven Springs. And uh, Jason and Sherry and Cheyenne, and their family was there, and we were talking, Jason and Sherry and I were just talking after the service, conversational. And Cheyenne, with about three or four other kids, is running around the church house, making noise and giggling. You know what kids do. And all of a sudden, she put on the emergency brake at me, and Cheyenne looked at me, and she just looked up, and she said, Brother Bobby, I want to be saved. Hmm. And I was like, you do? <laughs> you know, praise the Lord. You never down talk a child on those things. You never discourage them. And I said, you do? But now watch this. I could have easily, easily got her saved Bobby Wood style. Easy. I could have just said, well, little Cheyenne, you want to be saved? Yeah. Well, let's just sit right down here and you just repeat after me. And then she would have said my little prayer, not her little prayer from here, but my little prayer from here, and she would have said my little prayer. And then she would have looked at me like, what's next? Then I would have had to tell her, well, you're saved. And she would have been, all right. But I didn't do that. I knew it wasn't here yet. I encouraged her. Her mom and dad were standing right here. I encouraged her, and I said, I don't even remember what I said to her, but I said something, and she said, okay. And then she went to run around the church again, giggling, and, you know. And I looked at her mom and dad, and they understood where I stood. Now, I don't know, maybe three months, maybe, I don't know, a few months later, on a Sunday morning like this, I had preached at Shady Grove. Um... Cheyenne come out, left the pew during invitation. She walked up to me. I was on this side of the podium. I remember so clear. And she looked at me, and big, juicy tears were coming down her cheeks. And she didn't say, Bobby, I want to be saved. Her voice was broken. The tears were flowing. She didn't say, I want to be saved. She said, I need to be saved. And I knew it was the real thing. I didn't, I didn't even then say, Holy Spirit, you step over here, I'll take care of this. And I didn't get down there with her on the altar and do some little whatever. I said, Cheyenne, the Lord is already squeezing your heart you just trust him with all of your heart. And I quoted to her Romans 10, 13, whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall, shall be saved. Thank you, church. And she knelt down like a little child, called on the Lord, and guess what he did? I cannot, and you can hate me. I have been tomated. I've been ridiculed by pastors I love. And I've been called old-fashioned mourner's bench. I, you name it, I've been called it just because I'm still old school enough to believe that it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility and pleasure to tell a lost person they're lost and to tell a saved person they're saved. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you this word in verse 9, and I just want to talk about it a minute, and I want you to take your Bible, and I want you to go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to just, we're just going to take a few minutes and talk through this, because I, there's nothing I've ever preached where I want to be more plain and more um, down to earth than what I want to talk to you about today. I care nothing about running around with my hanky and giving you a hallelujah time. I love to rear back and preach, trust me. But this is so important um, because of what I had said earlier, okay? Uh, I, I just, no, no unsafe person deserves 
salvation. Nobody deserves it. But when a lost person gets to seek in the Lord, they deserve to know the right way. And I'm going to tell you now, uh, a lot of this of what I'm talking about, and I'm going to get right to the heart of it, a lot of this is, and trust me, I've been, I've been in ministry since 1984. I've been doing ministry. And I'm going to tell you, there, there's a corruption that came upon the body of Christ that COVID knocked in the head. The corruption was me and all the preachers that were around and churches got caught up on numbers. And we got caught up on having the biggest church, the biggest VBS, the biggest whatever, and, and, and it become, we got into competition. And so we got into this addiction for numbers that we lost sight of the soul of the person. And, and to do it, the gospel began to be compromised, and we adopted techniques and things to make it easier to get people saved. Okay, and so it's a, it was an extreme dangerous thing, but COVID, as I said, knocked all that in the head, and we're just tickled to have 10 people. Okay, now, I'm not bragging on COVID, but I want to tell you something. If God wants to spank somebody, he knows how to do it, Amen. and he still loves us. Amen? Amen. Are y'all in Luke 15? Yes. Now, <clears throat> Moms and dads, Haley, I think of you and Ben, I think of, you know, all you young couples. I don't want to pick anybody out. But it's really a big thing when your child comes up to you. Now, listen now, your child may not come to you, but you better be looking for it when the Lord starts dealing with them. And, and one of the tragedies today, if parents are so out, out of spiritual mode, first of all, if you're not earnestly praying for your child's salvation, it's going to be really, really challenging for you to even see if God's dealing with them. But you will begin to see, and some children may come up to you, and they, they may say, Mommy, Daddy, whoever, and they, it may not even be a parent. They may choose a grandparent whoever has a big influence on them, and they may, they may ask you a question, and you better pick up on it. You better pick up on it, okay? Because I, I want you to understand what this word repentance is. Now, let me give you an example and look how important this is to God. Look at Luke 15, um, 7. Are you there? Say amen. amen. I say unto you, and this is Jesus speaking, likewise, there is joy in heaven. Over one sinner that what? Repents. More than 99 just persons who need no repentance. He reiterates it in verse 10. I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. And so repentance is important to God. I mean, when there's nothing else that we do that brings joy in heaven... Then somebody getting saved, repenting, what in the world is it? If God is waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting because he wants to see people come to repentance, then I want to know what is this word, and I want to preach it right. Amen. I'm, I'm responsible today to preach this thing right. First of all, listen to me. Repentance is not regret. There's things in life that we have regret or we try to reform ourselves and maybe give up a habit or something and we, you know, we're sorry we got caught. That's not repentance. <clears throat> the Bible says, for example, Matthew 27, Judas, after he uh, understood what he did, he had tremendous regret. The King James says he went and repented himself, but the word repent me, that, that uh, the Holy Spirit used was a false repentance. Judas was only sorry he got caught. You understand that? Now, and listen to this. Repentance is not penance. A lot of people, and, I, and you know, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to be flat honest with you today. I think it's important. Repentance got corrupted by that word penance. I'm not picking on any denomination or any particular religion. I'm just telling you, when you had to crawl on your knees, kiss crosses, take toothbrushes, clean floors, fast, and make it hard on your body and do all 10,000 other things to show God you were sorry for your sins, that's not repentance. 
that you have to get on a mourner's bench and beg and beg and beg and cry and cry and cry and say, maybe God will hear me if I cry enough. Maybe he'll hear me if I weep loud enough. Maybe he'll save me if I stay long enough. That's not repentance. That's penance. Do you understand that? And a lot of people have gotten messed up on that. They can't find peace with God because they can't, they don't feel like they've cried enough or wept enough or prayed enough or did enough. But that's not God's method. Repentance is a work of God where God starts right here. And it goes from all the way here to here. And I've chosen three layman terms that I've handed you. And I want to talk about these important. The first one is when God starts working on a lost person's heart to bring them to salvation, the first thing he does is he causes you to, now this isn't a big word, but it's important, think about your spiritual condition. Did you know there are millions of people today? Let's just picture it this way. So, there, so this is the way to hell. This is the way to heaven. And so this way is wide and broad and easy, and there's a lot of people on it. And this way is straight and narrow, and very few that find it. But let's take a man, and he's, he's on the, he's, I mean, he's living it up right now. I mean, it's party hardy, have fun in life. And, and I just don't want to pick on party people. He could be a religious Pharisee. But it's somebody who doesn't know Christ. But they're living their life, whether it's in rebellion or religion, it doesn't matter. And they're walking this way. And they're just, I mean, nothing. And all of a sudden, God begins to move on this person. And for the first time in their life, now listen. They begin to seriously think about their destiny. They didn't care about heaven. They didn't care about hell. They didn't care about church. They didn't care about Bible. They didn't care about... But now, all of a sudden, repentance is beginning to work on them, which is a work of God, and they're thinking about their soul and where they're going when they die. That's a big deal. And this is why, listen, this is why it's so important. You know who I feel sorry for today? I feel sorry for a lost person who realizes there's an emptiness and a void and something is missing and they didn't have a mommy or a daddy that cared about their soul enough to tell them about Jesus. Why do you think people turn to everything under the sun? Why do you think people turn to cults? Why do you think people... Because they're trying to fill this void. They don't know any better. People join cults. They're just trying to find this something to, to take care of this inside. And that's why God says salvation starts at home. Christianity starts at home. Don't leave it to the preacher. Don't leave it to the youth leader. Don't leave it to anybody else. You teach your children while they're young. My mom and dad brought me up under the preaching of the gospel. And you know what? When the Lord began to cause me to think about my soul, I was 13 years old. I was 13 years old and the Holy Spirit broke in on me, opened my eyes to the fact that I was a sinner, that I was not a good little church boy, that I was a sinner, and let me tell you something. Now, now listen carefully. Listen. Remember Cheyenne giggling and carrying on? When you began to think about your, your soul and your destiny and your spiritual condition, when God the Holy Spirit's opened the eyes to your spiritual state, listen, listen. You're not going to be giggling about it. It's not humorous because you realize you're a sinner and you're separated from God and if you die you'll go to hell and let me tell you something and I have witnesses in this building and all over creation right now that will testify it is not funny knowing you're lost 
And because you're human and because you have a sinful nature, you'll fight it. I mean, you'll go fishing on Sunday. Well, I've got a job to do on Sunday, and I don't want to go to revival, and I don't want to, no, just this leave me. You'll do everything under the sun, and nine times out of ten, you will fight it. You'll kick against the pricks. Am I right? Does anybody have anybody in here that that was you? Now, I'm not saying that's everybody. I'm just trying to tell you when the Spirit works on you, here's what you will feel. You will have, yes, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But now listen, listen to me. Hell is running over with people who seriously thought about their spiritual condition but never did anything about it. And you know what hell is? Hell is an eternal conviction of sin that you never find peace from. You see, people alive now without Christ don't feel that. But when the Spirit of God moves, and listen to this, listen to me very carefully. You may have a fellow employee that may approach you and say, friend, I, you know, I've got confidence in you. I've been watching you, and I, I just tell you my life's a mess, and I, I just feel like I, I need, they may, you know, because the world doesn't know our words, they may say, I just feel like I need church, I need help, I need something, but you being a spiritual person, you're going to pick up on that and you're going to say, well, here, let me give you my pastor's number. You're not going to do that because they don't even know your pastor. They know you and they put their confidence in you and apparently the Spirit of God has brought them to you. And so here's the most important thing that's so important, and this is what I said earlier, when a person begins to think about their spiritual condition and and you know, most people in America still uh, understand heaven and hell, and they just want help. Here, this is important. Nothing is more important for a parent to teach a child than the good news about Jesus Christ. Okay? That is so, so, so vital because when people get, begin to think about their condition, like I said, they join cults because they've never been taught where to go. You understand? And let me tell you something, friend. I want you to eliminate every denominational word you know. I want you to, I want you to eliminate every religious language that you know. And I want you to master how to say with all of your heart one word, Jesus. People need Jesus. Isn't it amazing, Brother Tony, how we have so religionized everything that, that we forget and it's all about a person. His name is Jesus. <clears throat> Being saved is a relationship. So here I am, I'm thinking. I want you to, I want you to look at Luke 15, 17. And we're looking at a familiar story of a young man who wasted his life on riotous living. He has run out of money. He's run out of friends. And the Bible says in verse 17, and I want you to mark this in your Bible, he came to himself. You know what that means, don't you? The lights were turned on and he came to his spiritual senses. See, when he had a lot of money, had a lot of friends, had a lot of, uh, of fun and pleasure and living in this life, when he had all that, you know, it drowned it out anything spiritual. But when he lost it all, he began to think. You know what, church? Maybe, just maybe, I don't know. But maybe that's where God Almighty is bringing the world. Maybe God will take away the stuff. I don't know. But I will tell you this. 
God knows how to get our attention. Here's the second thing. Let's just read the Spirit. The word I gave you is it goes from thinking to troubling. I love that old-fashioned word, to be troubled. Just feel, look at the exclamation mark, not a period. This is, I mean, this guy is so spiritually uh, um, messed up. How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before <laughs> Now, this is a guy last Saturday who was on a high. He didn't care about spiritual things, and now all of a sudden, I am perishing. I'm dying. I need help. Look here. There's 18 inches between heaven and hell. You can think about God, think about salvation, but let me tell you something. This has to get down to here. Amen. That night Cheyenne had it here. A few months later, it had gotten down to here. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, and let me say something very, very, very important right here. Listen to me. The sorrow of the world brings grief, deep grief. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. I will never, unless I am so inspired of the Holy Spirit, and I do not like, I've heard it all my life, but I do not like it, is I do not like to witness to people. Let me use an example at a funeral home. Now, when I do a service, I want to preach the gospel. But let me tell you something. Watch out for foxhole faith. There's a sorrow of this world, and it's not repentance. It's just my relationship didn't work, and I just feel horrible, and I need help. There's a lot of reasons people want Jesus to get them out of a fix, not to save them, not so they'll live, start living differently, but just, you know, to get them out of their fix. That's a sorrow of the world. Be careful trying to witness to somebody when they've just lost somebody, and it's an emotional draining in their life. Don't naively and manipulate them to Jesus. But the sorrow of a godly sorrow is a troubling in my heart. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. And moms and dads, watch this in your child. Watch for this. This is a spiritual work on the inside that I want you to understand. Ben's going to be challenged. Let me tell you something. There is nothing more gut-wrenching for a pastor or a preacher who really tries to hold to the, the truths of the Bible. There's nothing more gut-wrenching than somebody from your flock who comes to you and wants to be saved. And you know that this is so sacred. This is so eternal. You better better tell them the right thing. And it's serious business. But you know what? The Holy Spirit doesn't hide himself. And when it moves from here to here, and that troubling, that, he, that conviction, you know when Paul brought the gospel to Felix in the Bible, the Bible says Felix trembled. Felix trembled. And I want to tell you something, friend. Pray for this, church. Pray for this on the body of Christ. Because nobody will ever be saved without repentance. Nobody will go to heaven without repentance. Pray that, and you pray in that spiritual condition on the person that it moves from the head to the heart. And my goodness, oh, the memories, the memories of when it had gotten into my heart when I knew that God was not my father. He was my judge. I had broken his law. I was a rebel. I was a a sinner. God wasn't happy with me. Ben, I didn't go home just, oh, hallelujah, good. No, I did, I did, it was horrible. It was horrible. God scared me.
But I go back to this one thing. I was taught where to go. I knew in Sunday school, as a little boy, I was taught the gospel. Verse 18, he said, he didn't say, I'm going to go to church. He didn't go say, I'm going to go find one of my good friends. He said, here's where I need to go. Which leads us to the final word. Verse 19. But verse 20 actually is where the rubber meets the road. He said, I'm no worthy to be called a son. Just make me a servant. And in verse 20, he arose and came to his father. You see, he had come to his senses. I mean, he was distraught. He was in a spiritual mess. He said, I'm going to go home. I'm not even, a ch- I don't even feel like a child. I'm just going to go as a servant. That's what happens when you get under the conviction of sin. And you know, we're told, I'm not, I'm not, listen, this is okay. I'm a preacher of the gospel. It comes with a territory. The previous church I, I was at, I had a guy to walk into my study one afternoon. I had preached on repentance and he walked in and this guy was a self-called preacher. And his face got red. He was so mad at me because he did not believe repentance was necessary, that I was making it harder on lost people to get saved, that I was, you know, everything called me everything under the sun. But that didn't surprise me because of this crazy addiction for numbers. We're willing to use any little thing any little thing to get people on our church roll. Mm -hmm. You know why you know why the last two decades churches have had so much inside trouble? Because we filled our church rolls with goats and not sheep. You can teach a thief, or let me say it this way, a thief can steal a watermelon out of your patch. But if you religionize him and educate him, he'll steal the whole patch. And we've put people on our church rolls just because we wanted to have numbers, because guess what? Every number means more money. And we we get this cursed, and we fill our churches with flesh. And the Bible says in the book of Acts, the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. When God adds somebody, when God saves somebody, they will be a blessing in your church. But when you compromise, you have just invited your own trouble. Amen? And then, so now I'm really, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a mess, and I've stopped. I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking about my spiritual condition. Now it's really bothering me. I'm, I can't even sleep, man. This thing's on my mind. I can't, I'm just, I've got to get right. And then, then I work with Ben over here, Ben Thomas, and and so I go to Ben, and, and he understands what's happening. And Ben might say, you know, we might sit down. He says, you know, did you grow up in church? You haven't? I said, no, man. I, I, my mom and dad didn't take me to church. I don't, even, I don't know. I went to a VBS one time, but I'm, I'm just a mess. But Ben's understanding that, that God's working on me. I'm not playing games. This is real. My life's at stake, and I mean it. You know when somebody's playing games or not. And I said, Ben, where do I go? What do I do? And you know, Ben could say, I'll tell you what, once you come to church Sunday, 
Well, that's nice, but what if I die between now and then? But if I'm ready and I'm under conviction, the best thing that Ben Thomas can tell me is this. He can tell me that God loves me so much that he sent his son to die for my sin. What if Ben Thomas gets the cart before the horse? What if Ben Thomas says, Bobby, you got to repent. What's that mean? Well, you got to stop sinning. I'll say, well, okay, I'll try it. Look at y'all out here. Y'all ain't stopped sinning yet. Come on, am I right? How many of you still sin? You don't have to lift your arm and brag about it or anything. You don't have to come to me. I do, you know. But you can't tell us a lost man stops sinning. He can't. Don't get the cart before the horse. Because watch. Y'all watching? I'm headed for hell. Ben Thomas says, Bobby, I want you to turn around here and look to the cross. Did you see what just happened when I turned around? My back is now to, on hell. And my face is toward the cross. By, by showing me Jesus, I synchronize at the same time, turn from my sin to Jesus. If Ben would have told me to turn from my sin and stop sinning, I, 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 I would have been like, okay, you know. But he says, just let me tell you about Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 1 9, Paul praised the Christians. He said, I'm thankful that I heard how you turn to God from idols. And you know what, church? We get this, we get this backwards. Our responsibility is this is just preach the cross. Just get them to the cross. To Christ who we're not ashamed of. Amen? Amen? To Christ. Is everybody clear? And I'm going to pray God put somebody in your life to just tell them about the Lord. And to be a witness for Jesus. And church, let me remind you all, look at me, brothers and sisters, before I quit. Your father, your father has waited over 2,000 years to bring the world to an end. So you could not only get saved, but tell somebody else how to get saved. Amen. And so when you think this way, God, this world's a mess. You, you should just come on back and finish it up. Maybe you've lost the spirit of 2 Peter 3, 9. Amen? Amen. God is so patient. Here it is. I, I'm just, I'm just, listen, here I stand. We're going to leave here in a few minutes and go back to life, but here I stand in a world of a cesspool of mess. And God has let his sun shine on this world one more day. You know why, don't you? Because he's everlastingly patient and full of love. And so when you think you're burnt out, when you think you've had enough of life, when you think you're tired of all of it, just remember 2 Peter 3, 9. Lord, I know why you haven't come back. And you want to know something else? It might be a thousand more years before he comes.
pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray that the Holy Spirit would work on their hearts and bring them to repentance. Amen? Amen. And for you, my dear friends, what about you? Was there ever a time in your life when the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to your spiritual condition? Did somebody deceive you? Did somebody manipulate you? Did somebody dupe you into a false experience? Do you know how many times I've heard people testify? They did the thing that they were supposed to do and there was nothing. I didn't feel nothing. I mean, I did what they told me to do, but I didn't feel nothing. You know what they're telling you? They're telling you nothing happened. I'm not a guy driven by feelings, but oh, my, 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 my. Do I not read my Bible that when Jesus comes into your life, there's a joy unspeakable? Do I not read in my Bible that when the Prince of Peace steps into your heart and life, is there not a peace that surpasses all what the brain can hold? Do I not read in my Bible in Thessalonians 1.5 that when Jesus comes into your life, there's this overwhelming assurance that you're saved and heaven bound? That's emotions. That's God. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. God, we've seen... Father, what repentance means to you, that there's joy, a celebration in heaven when a sinner comes to repentance. Father, I know I'm not supposed to ask this, and I know that you probably won't share it with me. But why aren't parents concerned about the spiritual condition of their child? Do they hate us Christians that much? That they don't want to be around us? God, there are so many lost people in Barron County. So I just pray, oh God, I just pray for that one. Lord, I want to thank you for just being, being willing to go way out of your way to a well just to win a woman, one. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just help us as Christians that are here today that, Lord, when we're working with someone or someone needs spiritual help, use us, oh God, to point people to the cross. Thank you for your word today, Father. Help New Life Ministry to just hold up Jesus. To just lift up the Lord in our songs, in our sermons, in our testimonies. Lord, deliver us from the corruption that has come upon churches. And help us to just make it all about your Son, the Lord Jesus. In his name, amen.